Let me begin by saying a little bit about how I got involved uh, in this work, uh, because in some ways it's uh, as surprising to me as it is to anyone. I feel that uh, this is not, I did not choose this work, somehow it chose me, and uh, <clears throat> I've had to ask myself the Watergate question, you know, what did I know and when did I know it? Uh, but let me begin with uh, April of 2004, because that's when the Abu Ghraib photographs were released, and uh, I knew enough at that time to be... Uh, uh, to feel that when we were told that this was just the work of a few uh, bad apples at the bottom of the barrel, that there was room for doubt uh, about uh, uh, this explanation. And I somehow expected that there would be some kind of significant outcry from the churches and the religious communities, but there wasn't. So I waited really sort of expectantly for uh, a year. I had already been involved in working against uh, the Iraq war and trying to mobilize opposition from within the religious community. I wrote statements. I got people to sign them. We ran them in uh, uh, publications. I even got a donor. Uh, we put one in the New York Times. Uh, but after a whole year from uh, the release of the Abu Ghraib photographs, there's still, I mean, there, there were, of course, expressions of concern, but there was no significant outcry. And to me, this really felt intolerable. So I thought, well, I'm just one person, uh, but, you know, I'm here in Princeton, maybe I can do something. Uh, this became a second full-time job for me. I still had my day job as a professor, but uh, it was quite uh, consuming, uh, both in terms of time and energy and, and emotionally, uh, to be immersed in a question like torture and, and human rights abuses uh, on a daily basis. It, it's taken a toll on me, and it's not been easy for my wife to be living with someone who uh, eats, drinks, and sleeps torture uh, day in and day out. Uh, she also teaches at Princeton Seminary. She teaches pastoral care and counseling. I will be speaking today out of my own tradition, the Christian tradition. Uh, I don't think it's possible to approach these questions with a view from nowhere. And I'll be speaking, uh, there'll be direct and indirect uh, people to my audience. I'll be speaking directly to Christians, but indirectly to everyone else, and I invite you to listen in, but uh, I feel that as a Christian minister, my primary responsibility and really competency is to try to address these matters uh, from a Christian theological standpoint in a way that will help move uh, the churches in my country uh, to uh, a more responsible stance on these matters. The National Religious Campaign Against Torture is, of course, an interreligious organization. Uh, I think, actually, it's probably the most uh, religiously diverse, progressive social movement in American history mm. because we have Muslims working together with Jews, working with evangelicals and Catholics and mainline Protestants such as myself and anyone else who wants to join in. And it's not just at the level of individuals. We actually got the National Association of Evangelicals to sign an important statement against torture. We founded Evangelicals for Human Rights. Uh, we, the the Cat U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, the wheels grind slowly there, but they, they do grind, they do move. Uh, we've, we've had significant cooperation from them. Uh, we, we have built a network, and it's uh, by, you know, you, you'll see uh, by some recent developments that I will mention, there's a very long way to go, but at least there's not absolute silence. And I can remember that line, which will become important uh, indirectly in what I have to say, from Martin Luther King's great uh, lecture, Rabbi Saperstein quoted it uh, at the plenary, 
at the Riverside Church where he said, a time comes when silence is betrayal. I'd like to begin by lifting up uh, a theme that I think has not received uh, the attention it deserves. It's the theme that violence finds refuge in falsehood. I myself first became aware of it through Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian novelist whose work commanded uh, attention uh, some years ago and who died uh, only a few years uh, back. In accepting the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1972, Solzhenitsyn included these words, violence, less and less embarrassed by the limits imposed by centuries of lawfulness, is brazenly and victoriously striding across the whole world, unconcerned that its infertility has been demonstrated and proved many times in history. What is more, it is not simply crude power that triumphs abroad, but its exultant justification. The world is being inundated by the brazen conviction that power can do anything, justice nothing. But let us not forget that violence does not live alone and is not capable of living alone. It is necessarily interwoven with falsehood. Between them lies the most intimate, the deepest of natural bonds. Violence finds its only refuge in falsehood. And falsehood, its only support in violence. Anyone who has acclaimed, once acclaimed violence as his method must inexorably choose falsehood as his principle. At its birth, violence acts openly and even with pride, but no sooner does it become strong, firmly established, than it senses the rarefaction, the thinning out, of the air around it, and it cannot continue to exist without descending into a fog of lies, clothing them in sweet talk. It does not always, not necessarily, openly throttle the throat. More often, it demands from its subjects only an oath of allegiance to falsehood, only complicity in falsehood. This connection was undoubtedly one that Solzhenitsyn had learned to make from bitter experience. But since he was a devout Christian, he would also have learned it, perhaps, from reading scripture. We see it, for example, in Psalm 5. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful, for there is no truth in their mouths, their hearts are destruction, their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. This theme is also evident in the prophets, as, for example, in Isaiah. For your hands are defiled with blood. Your lips have spoken lies. Their feet run to evil, and they rush to shed innocent blood. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off, for truth has fallen in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. When we turn to the New Testament, we discover this theme in Romans 3 at the end of Paul's prolonged and almost unbearable indictment of human sinfulness. The apostle seals his case by quoting from the Psalms, their throats are opened graves, They use their tongues to deceive. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. Allow me to give one last example. In the Gospel of John, just before Peter was again to lie by denying Jesus for the third time, 
we are unexpectedly reminded by the narrator that pre- Peter had previously turned to violence by cutting off a man's ear with his sword. The clear implication, we might think, is that Christ himself is denied whenever lies lead his followers into violence or whenever their crimes of violence are covered up and denied by lies, especially in the guise of pious falsehoods. In his famous essay on politics and the English language, written in 1946, George Orwell was incisive in making the same connection. In our time, he wrote, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Things like the continuance of British rule in India, the Russian purges and deportations, the dropping of the atom bombs on Japan, can indeed be defended but only by arguments which are too brutal for most people to face and which do not square with the professed aims of the political parties. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question-begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Orwell then gave examples of how political speech can become a cover for violence. Would you like to sit down? How political speech can become a cover for violence. Defenseless villages are bombarded from the air. The inhabitants driven out into the countryside. The cattle machine gunned. The huts set on fire with incendiary bullets. This is called pacification. Millions of peasants are robbed of their farms and sent trudging along the roads with no more than they can carry. This is called transfer of population or rectification of frontiers. People are imprisoned for years without trial or shot in the back of the neck or sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called elimination of unreliable elements. Such phraseology is needed if one wants to name things without calling up mental pictures of them. And what about today? What phraseology do we need if we want to name things without calling up mental images of them? Perhaps it would run something like this. Suspects are swept up almost at random from places around the world. Thousands are incarcerated in secret prisons. Many are quietly acknowledged to be innocent. Some of them are rendered to countries where they undergo unspeakable treatment and may never be heard from again. Others are subjected to so-called enhanced interrogation techniques by sources closer to home. No useful information is extracted that could not be obtained by other means. Those subjected to extreme interrogation, whether guilty or innocent, are forever mentally and emotionally maimed. This is called taking the offensive against terrorist brutality. No charges are brought against people detained without trial for years as habeas corpus is brushed aside. Outrages upon human dignity are perpetrated while Geneva Conventions are dismissed as quaint. Due process is manipulated in military tribunals behind the scenes to ensure that there will be no acquittals. Evidence obtained by coercion and torture is deemed admissible in court. Prisoners facing execution are denied access to lawyers, and then once they get lawyers, to the evidence against them. This is called fighting terror while upholding the rule of law. These are actual quotations. A generation of Arabs and Muslims is radicalized against the United States by graphic evidence of humiliation and abuse. (laughs) 
Some become suicide bombers. Dictatorial powers are concentrated in the executive branch, the so-called unitary executive, which, by the way, is not being undone by the Obama administration, while Congress sleeps or caves. Torture regimes appeal to the tainted U.S. example to defend their indefensible ways, while our closest allies, whose cooperation we need, are increasingly alienated and shocked. This is called laying the foundations of peace for generations to come. Political language concluded Orwell, and with variations, this is true of all political parties, is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. Obama's executive orders, a time of hope and concern. Let me just mention that you may know on the first day in office, President Obama signed some executive orders, you know, the closing Guantanamo, ending rendition, supposedly, and so on. That, that was actually a project of my organization. I can't say that we can take full credit for it, but we worked on that for a year, and we got retired uh, uh, secretaries of defense and secretaries of state and, and military leaders. Uh, and that was, that was what that meeting with the transition team was about that I mentioned. Uh, uh, we had something to do with it. But the executive orders by President Obama on January 22nd to close Guantanamo, to end harsh interrogations, to abolish secret prisons are a case in point. They represent a huge step forward and are cause for rejoicing. They go a long way toward putting an end to the lawlessness of the past and restoring the United States to decency. High-ranking officials from the outgoing administration openly acknowledged before they left that a policy of torture had been implemented in the so-called War on Terror. Nevertheless, Although the new executive orders are encouraging, they still leave room for concern. The president's decision to shut down Guantanamo is most welcome. Yet it is not only lacking in detail, but also allows too much time for its implementation. Guantanamo should be closed in less than a year, and now the most recent announcement is it won't be closed in, in the, this coming January, and the date of closing is uh, uh, indefinite. Uh, the many prisoners who can go home should be immediately repatriated. Safe havens must be found for others who would face torture or persecution if sent back. A handful will need to be tried in domestic courts, and that will now happen with some of them in New York. I mean, it's often said, if you follow these things, that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the mastermind behind September 11th. Well, maybe he is, but if you've ever seen the long list of things that he's confessed to, uh, and this is the guy who was waterboarded 183 times in one month, uh, you know, it's, it's the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's everything. I, I don't know if they know who the masterminds of September 11th uh, actually were. I mean, it's just sort of taken for granted in our media, you know, the, the, the mastermind or confessed mastermind. What do these confessions mean from a guy who has been subjected to these kinds of uh, brutal uh, interrogations? But, uh, you know, a handful does need to be tried for sure. You know, closing the CIA black sites is also enormously important. Secret prisons have no place in a democratic society. Their only purpose is to get around the Geneva Conventions and other laws so that torture and abuse can be carried out. No option should be left open for reviving those sites, and yet they are crime sites. And, and the ones that were closed were also scoured and destroyed. And we learned just in the past 10 days or so of continuing secret prisons in Afghanistan. It's actually in the New York Times, which sometimes tells the truth. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, there used to be a joke uh, back in the Cold War about uh, the difference between the people who read Pravda and the people who read the New York Times. The people who read Pravda knew that their newspaper was censored. <laughs> Establishing a single standard for interrogation, also promulgated in principle by the president, uh, is essential if torture is to be flushed out of our system. Uh, in fact, the Army Field Manual in the, in the large print, you have to read the fine print, the Army Field Manual in the large print establishes the golden rule principle, which should be of interest in itself and also for this parliament, which has uh, held up the golden rule as a way of uniting uh, uh, diverse religions, which I think is quite right. Uh, and you know, if you're a field commander in a difficult circumstance, you have to ask the question, would I want this to be done to one of my soldiers if they were interrogated? I mean, it's, you know, the role reversal, the universalization. The golden rule is actually quite sophisticated. There's even a large philosophical discussion of it. Uh, you know, it, it's a pretty good standard. You know, people can understand it. It can be implemented. Uh, and that's, that's what's in the large print of the Army Field Manual. And, and you know, my group and other human rights groups are quite happy about this being uh, instituted as a single standard for interrogation because one of the things that happened at Abu Ghraib is they had two standards. You know, the CIA special operatives people came in and said, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. So uh, one of the things you have to have to eliminate torture is a single standard of interrogation. So the, a step was made in that direction. Uh, and uh, to do it on the basis of the Army Field Manual seems to be a good way to go. Nevertheless, serious ambiguities remain. Uh, a disturbing loophole was left by establishing a task force mandated to review this single standard in order to determine whether exceptions should be made for the CIA. And as I'll mention, you know, they actually came in allowing loopholes, no, not, not directly, but indirectly. Second, and this, this is crucial, this is the fine print, <clears throat> the field manual itself contains a notorious Appendix M in which interrogation techniques are permitted that would qualify as cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment under the Geneva Conventions. By the way, you know, one of the... Uh, chief propaganda victories of the uh, Bush administration was to break the connection in international law between torture and cruel and human and degrading treatment. You know, the Convention Against Torture that was eventually ratified by the United States under the administration of Ronald Reagan actually <coughs> has some good things to say about uh, human rights standards. You know, um, <clears throat> It's the Convention Against Torture and other cruel and human and degrading treatment, which I think means that what international law is primarily opposed to is cruel and human and degrading treatment, of which torture happens to be the worst instance. You can't break them off and narrow the definition of torture and then say everything else is okay. So, so these techniques of, uh, well, think of the famous Abu Ghraib figure, the hooded man, you know, you know, the, the iconic uh, Christ-like uh, hooded man with his arms stretched out, uh, uh, standing on a box with wires, apparently they weren't connected, hanging down from his arms. That's cruel and human and degrading treatment. That sensory deprivation is a form of... Uh, cruel treatment, and when people are subjected to sensory deprivation for any period of time, and it depends on the uh, person, so standing on the box, having the arms extended, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the other side. So sensory deprivation and, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, stress positions, they're used in combination. These techniques leave lasting emotional and mental harm. I mean, a person who is subjected to these kinds of abuses is never the same. Again, Jose Padilla, uh, an American citizen, was subjected to solitary isolation and, and uh, sensory deprivation. Maybe you saw the photograph of him being taken to the dentist in his orange uniform with those earphones on to keep him from hearing anything. <clears throat> 
blackened out uh, goggles, you know, and, and he's you know, shackled and he's got two uh, guards on either side. I mean, this is a guy who has been subjected to severe sensory deprivation and solitary confinement, all of which are allowed by Appendix M. And his lawyer says he's a vegetable. I mean, that, that, that's what happens. So it's Orwellian, enhanced interrogation techniques. I mean, the, the, these forms of torture that don't leave any marks, it's different from torture in the ancient world or even up through American slavery. I mean, you can see photographs of, like I've seen a, a, a man, a, a, an African-American man, who had big scars across his back. You know, that, that, that's what torture meant prior to its being adopted by democracies. Democracies like to use forms of torture that don't leave any marks. So, so these, uh, the so-called torture light, there's nothing light about torture light. That's another Orwellian phrase. That, uh, the, the, these various forms of, of torture that don't leave any marks, it's sleep deprivation and isolation and being shackled in stress positions and so on. These are still allowed by Appendix M. And that task force that the president appointed in January came in in the summer and approved uh, uh, the field manual as it stands. So uh, th this is one of those loopholes. I mean, the history of U.S. involvement in torture is a history of loopholes. And it goes way back. Oh, I didn't tell you how I actually answered that Watergate question. Let me do a little aside here. Uh, I, I now own... I'm the proud owner of a copy of Life magazine from July 17, 1970. And I, I went online and thought, you know, maybe, maybe the article's up there, you know, these things get posted. Uh, it wasn't, but it talked about the article I remembered reading, and uh, an outfit came up that sold old copies of Life magazine, so I ordered this one. And that's the issue that showed the tiger cages in Vietnam. So I, I, you know, I, I wasn't reading Life magazine much in those days. I must have read it in the summer at my parents' house. The only thing I can imagine. I was a seminary student at the time, but it, you know, it left a trace. You know, who knew that this would lead somewhere? Uh, for me, I never forgot it. In fact, I continued to do reading in that area off and on. I remember reading a book called Hidden Terrors about uh, U.S. interrogation. Uh, police training in Uruguay. It was made into a movie by Costa Gavras, and maybe some of you remember that movie. Uh, Mitrioni um, he used to bring people off the street and uh, torture them to death in front of uh, police uh, academy students. And he was eventually captured by the Tupamaros and uh, executed. But uh, there was nobody to talk about this with. I mean, I, I remember quite uh, vividly trying to bring this up with uh, someone who I had a lot of respect for, a big figure in the anti-war movement, and I just didn't want to hear it. You know, my words fell to the ground. So I sort of kept these things and pondered them in my heart. You know, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I can't do a steady diet of this. It, it's, it's been pretty hard over the last five years. But, you know, up until then, you know, off and on, you know, I read Chomsky on... Uh, uh, the uh, Terror Network, and you know, I read Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number by Kobo Terror. I read, you know, it was a, something I kept track on, and I realized that my government was not only involved in, a, in an unjust and immoral war, but that it was also complicit through the Phoenix program and so on in uh, torture. <clears throat> There was a guy named Don Luce who wrote about these things from Saigon. His, his best friend was tortured to death. and He, he worked with International Voluntary Services, uh, part of the uh, uh, Quaker Network and the World Council of Churches. And Yeah, I, I read that stuff you know, even earlier, I guess. I read it when I was an undergraduate. So I, I had a history. I mean, it didn't come out of nowhere that I got concerned enough to eventually do the conference and get NRCAT off the ground, uh, but you know, it, it's only in retrospect that I can see these little sort of like skipping a rock across the water. You know, you see the places where it touched down, and you, you can trace them back. 